So my name is uh, Bill Clem. If you hear anything that you disagree with today, my name is Mark Hafner. Okay, so um, uh, so uh, I had the privilege of being here a couple years ago uh, to speak, and so got the opportunity again today to um, uh, do these couple workshops. Tomorrow's my wife's birthday, and so I'm taking a page out of being a good husband and going home tonight. And uh, so uh, if you have any questions or whatever, I'm more than happy to uh, hang uh, around, although we do this workshop next hour too. So uh, you, if you go to a second workshop somewhere, I'd be here to field any questions, but I'll try and leave a little bit of um, Q&A time on the end, okay? Um, I know that the title or even the idea of father may have been pretty uh, uh, general or nebulous, and so what the heck are we going to talk about today? Uh, I'm convinced that our view of Father affects our view of God, and I'm convinced that um, uh, sometimes then that translates into even how we father, so it becomes this kind of loop. Uh, yesterday I had coffee with a, uh, a, a man who was in his late uh, 40s, and as we were uh, having this coffee together, um, I'm kind of thinking about the seminar as some of the things that we're talking about, and I'm going, okay, so um, let's just kind of talk for a little bit. And one of the things he said to me was, have you always been this confident? And I don't really think I'm confident. I don't necessarily think I have a great self-image, but evidently there's a curve, and uh, <laughs> there are people that have a, a weaker one or less of uh, a self-image that's helpful than, than I do. So I said, well, Look at this restaurant. How many people do you think are in here? And he goes, I don't know, 40. And I go, well, my, when I walk into this room, I go, there's 40 people in here. There's probably 20 people in here who don't like me. But that's because they don't know me. And he goes, wow, I wish I could think like that, that if they knew me, they'd like me. Because he goes, I'm probably the other way. The 20 who know me and that like me don't know me. And if they got to know me, they wouldn't like me. So uh, there's a very different look at that. So I said, so tell me, why do you think got you to that place. And he said, I have a dad who's a critic. Everything I did, uh, he would say, you could have done it different, you could have done it better. Uh, that was okay, but okay, here's a guy who hasn't been under his father's fathering for 20 years. And he's still kind of limping through life, having had a critic for a father who never in a sense launched him to be able to even walk into a cafe without being, in a sense, thinking that there are people there that are scary because they don't like him. And if they got to know him, they wouldn't like him as well as some of them already do. Now, I don't know where you find yourself on that continuum of uh, self-awareness and, and ego strength or however you want to describe it. But I do believe that part of that does uh, get nurtured into us, especially by our dad. And so I want to take a, a quick look at a few different views of, of some um, kind of stereotypical fathers, okay? I know that there isn't one person who lives up to only one of these. We're usually a constellation of several different fathering styles. But so, for example, the first one uh, that I want to suggest is that there is a mad dad, Okay, uh, someone who is just constantly angry, uh, and you have two or three responses as as a child in that home. One of those responses is that you could be someone who basically hides. Uh, I don't want to be around it, and so I'm going to get away from it. Hopefully, he'll yell at someone or something other than me, and you're hiding. But it isn't just a physical hide. Sometimes it's hiding how you're feeling so that he can't get mad at that, or hiding what you've done so he can't get mad at that, whether that happens to be grades or something that's broken or uh, a question you have or something you've said, and you're just trying to keep your dad distanced from your life because that's one of the ways that you can keep the peace. And so that's what you're willing to at least pursue, okay? Okay. Um, I'm going to walk through two or three of these before I kind of look at how that would impact our view of God, okay? But one of the bad things, obviously, is you become a hider. 
One of the things that's actually a good thing, just one second, is there a way that we could turn off the TV in the other room? Do, do you hear? Okay. Oh, they're doing a seminar back there? Okay. Then it isn't a TV. It's actually information. All right. Then uh, they're probably asking if there's a way to turn me off too. So we'll just kind of uh, mo move on. So as we kind of look at this idea of there's a mad dad, okay, you can become a hider. Okay? I want you to think about that in terms of God for just a second. That, that what happens often is that when you and I sin, okay? Now, some of you may think you don't, so you can just kind of hitchhike on mine because I do. Okay? So when I sin, I have a tendency to think I can't go right to God because he's mad. So I've got to let things cool off a little bit. I've got to let God's anger settle a bit, and then I can come back to him maybe a day or two or a week or next Sunday. I can just, if there's a way for God to chill out before we kind of reconnect, it's probably going to go better for me. There's nothing in Scripture that says that. No, in fact, in Hebrews, it says just the opposite. It says, because we have a high priest who was tempted in every way as we were, yet he didn't sin. He's sympathetic towards us. And the Hebrew author goes on to say, so let us draw with, near with confidence. So it isn't let us stay away till we're confident. It's, okay, I sinned. The Christian response to sin is run to dad, not run away from dad. But your dad can predispose you, your fathering experience on earth can predispose you to a runaway response to God rather than a run-to response to God, okay? So let's just kind of put that on, um, uh, we'll hold that for a second, and let's uh, look at another one, like a military dad, okay? Military dad isn't necessarily mad. He can get angry if we somehow uh, cross the line because we need a court-martial, Okay? But for the most part, a military dad just barks out orders and has a, a bar that you're supposed to clear. Okay? And there's clear expectations as to what a good son looks like and what a bad son looks like. And he lets you know that was bad son conduct. Okay? Now I want you to think about that in terms of how you might respond to that. Because it seems to me like the two big responses to that is either I'll do it or I'll screw it. Okay? So I'm either going to go for it or I'm going to get away from it. And that seems to be a typical response to men in the church. I'm either going to go for it or I'm going to get out of here. But we don't have a lot of people that have a military dad picture and have a picture of a God who goes, I'm either happy with you or not, and that are just kind of hanging in there. They're either going for it because they know that here's the bar, and if I clear that, God's pleased with me, okay? I'm not saying that's how God sees it. I'm saying that's how we see it, just like the runaway uh, from the mad dad. There's a clear the bar with a military dad, okay? And if you don't want to play the game because you feel like I'm never going to clear the bar, then it's forget that bar, I'm just checking out, uh, I'll join my own army, or I'll be somebody who's not in the army and be anti-army, because I'm not going to let this military dad reign on my life, okay? The thing that you actually inherit that's good from that is the idea that you believe there's structure. You believe there is an order. There, you believe there is a way to live your life. And as much as you might push that away, you push that structure away and put in some other structure that you feel is flexible to you when in reality, you know what? Your military dad actually thought he was creating a safe, structured environment where you could know for sure how things were supposed to be. It didn't occur to him um, intentionally for the most part that he was creating in you something that Ephesians 6 would say to fathers, where it says, fathers, don't exasperate your children, but raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And one of the ways kids get exasperated is when there's no way that they can actually do well. That they, you know, like I was telling you about this guy I had coffee with, he said, I had a critic for a dad. He probably had a military dad who'd put a structure in place, and this guy hadn't lived up to his structure. But he carried that structure around with him 
constantly believing he was failing 24 hours a day. Okay? Can you see how that would affect your relationship with God? That God isn't happy, you know. He has to love me because he's stuck with me. He's God. But he's not happy about it. You know, if he could, if he could like do something about it, he'd do something about it. But he's stuck with me. Okay? There's a, a different way of looking at God, uh, Father or a different way of expressing Father that, that comes uh, basically in the idea of a busy or absent Father. So the busy Father gets taken away by work. An absent Father can, can be one who's even left the home. And uh, g- boys, for the most part, are left to figure out what am I going to do. Am I going to be the dad of the home, which happens a lot if you're the oldest sibling? Or am I going to be the one who uh, figures out a place to get another dad, like a coach or a teacher or an employer or a neighbor? Or am I going to be the person who basically says, I am mad at all authority? Okay? Those are some typical responses to an absentee father. Now, if you want to do that in terms of God, if we think we have an absentee God, it's something like he set the world in motion and it's up to us to govern it or run it, okay? He might have even um, met you somewhere in a saving uh, conversion type uh, experience, and the next time we're really going to have a significant moment, it's going to be in heaven. And, And between conversion and heaven, he's absent, okay? Uh, that's not what the Bible says, but that gets informed by us having that kind of father experience on earth, okay? If we've had an absent or passive fathering experience, we have a tendency to impose an absent or passive fathering experience from God in heaven, okay? So, uh, I want you to kind of not lose where we're going, but we've had a mad dad and a military dad and this absentee dad, okay? And like I'm saying, there really probably isn't one uh, unless it is that absentee dad who left when you were four and you've never heard from him or seen him again, so he can't come in and be angry. He can't come in and and set some uh, structure like a military dad. But for the most part, we have some kind of, um, you know, uh, tapestry of a bunch of these different uh, pieces woven together. But there's um, one last one that I'd like to look at, and that's a sad dad. A dad who didn't get to do the schooling or the occupation that he wanted, and he started to have a family, and so he felt the responsibility of providing for the family, and he lives his whole life feeling like he'd rather do something else. And he cannot not communicate that So you have felt sometimes like you're the reason your dad isn't, and you can fill in the blank. But the bottom line is you feel like you're the reason your dad isn't happy, okay, and that he's sad. And some of the responses to having that sad kind of dad is that um, one of those is that we want to become the person who brings fun or laughter to the party. So we become the, the uh, class clown. We become that person who uh, is always kind of bringing laughter. And somebody asks you, how are you doing? And you go, well, never mind how I'm doing. How do you think the Seahawks are doing? You know, and it's just some way of always deflecting and always trying to bring a, a sunnier space because you don't really want sadness to come. Okay? One of the other responses to a sad dad can, can be the whole idea that I just want to get numb. I don't really have the expectation it's going to be happy. I just don't want to hurt. And so medications come in a lot of different forms, from substances to entertainments. And I wish I could tell you uh, how many people sit across from me on any given day, not any given week, but any given day, and tell me how they feel trapped in pornography as an entertainment to try and somehow bring something to their world that, in a sense, would please them, okay? Um, 
It's amazing, and I'm sure most of you have heard some kind of talk on brain science as far as uh, what pornography does to somebody. And I'm not going to belabor that. That isn't what this workshop's about. But I do want you to, to know that um, some of the research that's fairly current suggests that when you are hitting and hitting and hitting different pornography sites, that what starts to happen is that you're not even turned on by a woman as much as by the image, and it has to be a new image. And if they, they monitor guys and let them just kind of uh, go porn crazy as part of the lab experiment on it, and if they watch the same woman and get a different hit of that same woman, their stimulation starts to go down. And it has nothing to do with seeing nakedness, has nothing to do with you fantasizing, has everything to do with the ability to be stimulated. It has to be by newness, not even by oddness or kinkiness or provocativeness or sensuality, just by newness to all those things. Can you see how that starts to erode a soul for anything called faithfulness? <laughs> and, and subtly you start to think, God can't be pleased with me because I've been a Christian for a couple of years. He's, he's tired of me. He needs a new, new conversion site to go to. I mean, as weird as it is, you start hearing people say things like, hey, when somebody becomes a Christian, the angels are cheering. And you're going, yeah, had that party, got the T-shirt, you know, I'm done. But there isn't any place where it says if angels are cheering, that they quit. It's like, you accepted Christ, yay. And they're kind of like, can you hurry up and get up here? Because I'm tired of clapping. It's been 30 years now, you know. Uh, I'm still clapping for the Apostle Paul, and it's been over 2,000 years. I mean, it's a standing ovation that doesn't sit down, doesn't quit. They're not people just surfing the Internet, being excited by conversion, 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 conversion. God is your father, and he's delighted with you. And if you've grown up in a sad dad home, that's nearly impossible for you to believe. Because you've grown up seeing a dad who can watch something very exciting happen in his life, but there's always something on the downside of that. That isn't my personality. But I know that I have four kids, and there's eight years of difference between my oldest and my youngest. And I know that my youngest grew up with a sad dad because from her seventh grade year till her first year out of high school, her mom had cancer, and then her mom died. She didn't have the same household that her eight-year-older sister had, the house that laughed and had, had all kinds of uh, time to where we would go to a swim meet, couldn't go to the swim meet because we just had chemo yesterday and we're throwing up today. And, and we, I just came home with my personal record from a swim meet, Dad. Your mom just got told that the cancer's back. She's out of remission. And it just felt like almost whatever she was excited about got trumped by something sad. And, and I'm not making an excuse. I'm just saying, so my daughter's got a hole to dig out of. And I'm not just saying it's girls. I'm saying it's when you are parented that the fathering that you were parented with impacts you. And if we're not careful, we develop a theology and understanding of who God is based on our human father. And that's a bad way to source our way into God. God has basically said, here's who I am. And you can evaluate how good your dad was based on me, rather than here's who your dad is, and you can base whether or not you want a heavenly father based on him. Okay? It's, it's backwards to read God out of your fathering experience rather than to uh, see God and then evaluate your father and to put a trajectory to you being a dad and to be able to interpret what that's going to do or what you're going to let it do to you based on your heavenly father. And, and that's what I want to encourage each one of you to, is the idea that um, you didn't sit down and study your dad. 
and go, here are the three principles from my dad I want to take away. You didn't do that. But somehow that's often what we do with God in heaven. We study him rather than experience him, and we principalize some abstract ideas of what he's like, and it never connects to giving us any kind of character change. So what I want to do is uh, I want to suggest some uh, ways that I think um, moving into being a dad, and I know some of you guys are are, uh, years away from that and you're young, and I just want to help you maybe even think about being a dad, but also you have a heavenly father like this. And that God hopes that we'll have a family resemblance to our Heavenly Father that's more profound than the family resemblance to our earthly father. Okay? So, two kind of things that start running through our mind or our heart subconsciously. One is if we didn't have a good fathering experience, we'll say, I never want to be that guy to my kids. And there's part of that guy that is you, and it can be redeemed. Like a military dad who brings structure, an angry dad who brings, it matters rather than apathy. A a sad dad who says everything isn't okay. (laughs) You know, uh, there, uh, I think I've probably heard it from at least five different counselors, and I've seen it in several different um, written material at, at this point that said more than half our counseling would be gone if somebody would just believe life is hard. And they come into a counselor's office because they go, I just, I don't know what's wrong. This is hard. And nobody said life would not be hard. I mean, look at who you follow. You follow a guy who was born uh, into poverty, okay? One of the ways I know he was born into poverty, um, when you went to Jerusalem, you offered a lamb as an offering, okay? And there were actually, if you remember the story of Jesus being born, uh, just two miles out of Jerusalem where the temple was, there's a city called Bethlehem. And when Jesus was born, angels appear to, hello, shepherds. And it's kind of interesting because those shepherds were raising sheep that were probably raised to be offered uh, at the temple, okay? So as we kind of look at this idea, you you were expected to offer a sheep, but there was provision for someone who couldn't afford a sheep that they were allowed to offer doves. When Jesus is dedicated at the temple, Mary and Joseph offered doves, not lambs. So Jesus is born into poverty, okay? He uh, grows up, starts his ministry. Somebody goes, hey, I want to be your follower. He goes, really? Because the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. He's homeless. So we got a guy born in poverty who's homeless, and we're saying, God, can I have a new Mercedes and a big house? He's going, are you kidding me? I would have liked that, and I'm God. So we're following the wrong guy if that's what we want, okay? Bottom line is, life's going to be hard, and you followed a guy who's lived the hardest life. And he's saying, if, if I will live this life for you, I'm inviting you to live a life that I will live with you. So I'm not going to keep you from hard times, but I won't make you go through them alone, okay? So part of your life has been hard, and there's a heavenly father who wants to father you out of those wounds, but be able to say, I didn't make a mistake with the dad you had. I was shaping your soul. So let's take the shape, make it more like Jesus, and let's use that. So saying somehow, my dad was a bad dad, so I don't want anything to do with that past, is not necessarily to believe that God could redeem it. Okay? Second thing is that you can say something like, um, here's the kind of dad I want my kid to have. 
So I'm going to be happy rather than the sadness that I feel. I'm going to be um, structured even though I'm not structured at all. And you start to put what you want your kid to have as a dad into the projection or into the mix. And I want you to see both of those make you someone you're not. You're not someone who didn't have your dad, and you're not who you want your kid to have. You are who you are. So bringing you to the table with a heavenly father is the best you you get to bring. It's not avoiding your dad, and it's not being the dad that you think your kid needs. It's being the person who's being shaped by a heavenly father. And one of the tools that he's used to shape you is your earthly father. Okay? So let's kind of put that into a little bit of a mix and look at the idea. The first thing I want you to see is that um, character, rather than conduct, is what a good dad is made of. It's what your heavenly father is made of. In James 1, it says every good and perfect gift comes from the father of life with with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So, James 1.17 says, God doesn't change. He's reliable. And if you are a dad who parents by the circumstance, and your kids never know what kind of dad they're going to get, they don't know if they're going to get dad who's mad, or dad who's glad, or dad who's sad. They don't know if they're going to get a military dad, or if they're going to get absentee dad. I don't care, do what you want. If you kind of like float with the circumstance... Then, then you bring an instability to the family. And your heavenly father brings stability even to a life that feels chaotic. You may very well feel like your life is so random, and yet the thing you're to count on isn't that God's going to make it painless, but that God doesn't change, and that you can count on him being who he said he'd be. Not who you think he is, not who you want him to be, but who he said he will be. He's that person. He's that God, regardless of what you find yourself struggling with, regardless of what you find yourself succeeding at. So here's how that looks. I want you to ask yourself, I asked this guy at the cafe yesterday, so... um, Let's just call him uh, Alex. So I said, Alex, here's the deal. I get to have a one-on-one time with God the Heavenly Father. He's going, okay. I go, and I just burned up my question all on you. I said, so tell me, what do you think about your son Alex? And he was quiet for a minute. He goes, nothing good's going to come out of his mouth. Do you see how... He having a dad who is a critic makes him think that he has a heavenly father who's a critic. And that even if I were to ask God, what do you think of Alex? Alex thinks God doesn't think much of Alex. Alex thinks there's nothing good going to come out of his mouth. Okay? That's a, um, a huge lie that the enemy of your soul would love you to believe. I just want to read, I'm just going to read, there's a whole list of things that the Bible says about God's children, you. I'm just going to read a few of those, okay? So, I am a child of God and he is my father. I am a saint. I have been brought near to Christ. I have been adopted by God. I'm an heir with Christ. I am blessed with every spiritual blessing. I'm a child of promise. I'm the light of the world. I'm the salt of the earth. I've been justified and made right with God. I am free from condemnation. I am a new creation. I am God's masterpiece or workmanship. I'm a minister of a new covenant. I am a proclaimer of reconciliation. I want you to think about that for a minute because maybe those words sounded too deep or not the words you necessarily use. 
But I want you to understand those words aren't written for pastors. They're written for God's kids. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. That's Ephesians 1.3. That's, that's a, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Not your pastor has. Not someone who really, really, really walks with God. Every child of God. So when I'm saying God doesn't change, God loves you. Okay? Now, for most of us, we think the minute we've done something wrong, there's a love meter somehow that goes from 100 to 1, and that if God's full on 100% loving us and we did something wrong, it had to at least drop to 95. And if we do a couple more wrong things, it's going to drop below 80 before the day's over. And if we make the day and we have, ha still have some uh, points in the tank, then that's a win. Okay? Then we can get recharged in something called a quiet time or going to church, and then boom, we're back up to the 100%, and we just start dwindling down again. You know? Maybe uh, a fun way of looking at that. I was at this restaurant one time, and the guy, there were about five guys at this table across from me, and they put like 25 ones on the table, and they stacked them up. And when the waitress came, they said, that's your tip. She's looking at these 25 ones going, awesome. And he said, every time you do something we don't like, we're taking one off the stack. So uh, she comes to the table and goes, didn't fill our water glasses, you know, and just she watches them start eroding. They're messing with her, and they give her the whole stack at the end anyway. But they're just, sometimes we think of God like that. Here's your day. Here's your life. Your life is going to be awesome. And every time you do something wrong, I'm taking a little bit of what your life could have been away. You could have had an awesome, meaningful life. Now you'll just have a meaningful life. And if you're not good, you might just have a life. And God's going to just keep whittling away the matterness, what, how your life matters to someone. It just starts to dwindle, okay? That's part of what it looks like to be someone who doesn't understand the character or the consistency of God, that he loves you the same whether good or bad. He loves you the same whether productive or not productive, whether you have confessed your sin or whether you're living with unconfessed sin. It doesn't affect his love for you because you didn't earn it. It was a gift that was given to you by Christ earning it. So the only way he's going to take it away is if Christ somehow didn't succeed at what he did. And we kind of know he did succeed because he rose from the dead. If he died on the cross for your sin, that's not good news. If he died on the cross for your sin and he rose from the dead, that's good news. And we know that that's what happened. And so we know good news that God loves us no matter what because there's no change in God. No variation, not even a shifting shadow. So we'll look at a second one, and that's the idea that he's relational, okay? That, that God is relational. He's not some kind of administrator up in um, uh, heaven. He's actually in relationship with us. And so I'm going to read a few verses out of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount here in uh, Matthew 6. And I'm going to start with verse 26. It says, um, look at the birds, Are they, uh, uh, birds of the air. They s do not sow or reap or store uh, in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? Okay? He's not talking about a bird that gets cared for and people. He said, if a bird gets cared for, a person. If God knows a sparrow, why do you think he doesn't know you? If he's aware of their situation, why do you think he's not aware of yours? But if you have an absentee dad, if you have a busy dad, you're thinking, if it's a big deal, he, he might show up. But if it's just little things, he's too busy or he's gone and he's left that up to me. And what I want you to understand is that God isn't nearly as concerned with what you're doing as why you're doing it. 
And that's why the little things matter, is because the little things still reveal the why. Okay? So it isn't like little things are little things because it's only this decision and it doesn't have a big impact. And this is a big decision because it has a big impact. Little and big have everything to do with our heart. If we have a heart that requires aligning with God to make the decision, so what car are you going to drive? God doesn't care. God doesn't care if it's a Honda. He doesn't care if it's an Accord. He doesn't care if it's a BMW. He doesn't care if it's a Volkswagen. He doesn't care. Okay? But that's the what. He does care why you picked the car you picked. So if you picked a car because somehow if I have a BMW or a Mercedes or a Porsche, that makes me worth more or I'm more valuable, then it matters to God because now he's got you getting your identity from someone other than him. And that's a big deal. Didn't care what kind of car, but cared why you picked the car you picked. Okay? Somebody has a child, and they're excited about that child. Somebody doesn't have the child, and they're bitter about their barrenness. Honestly, God is more concerned with the heart of those two parents than whether or not they had children or not. Okay? I know that that sounds weird, but we have put such a premium on the thing. Those of you who are in high school... God really doesn't care where you go to college, but he cares why you picked the college you picked. If you're going to a Bible college because you think that will please your parents, God's saying, what about me? You go to University of Oregon because you say, they have the program I want, but God's saying, did you ever ask me if it's the program I want you to take? He cares way more about the why than the what. And that's because he's personal. It's not like, go ahead and get the car you want, get the college you want, get the person you want, get the family you want, and then put that all over in the asset column and say, God, aren't you pleased? He's going, I'm not impressed because it was all mine when it was over here before it was yours. You didn't add anything to my account. What I want is the person who, when they don't have it, loves me, and if they do have it, loves me. I want to be your father, not your provider. I don't want to simply write the checks. I want to be involved in the decision, and not so that we have the right decision, but that so we have the right relationship, because I'm a personal God. And I'm talking to you about being a father. That's, that's the issue. It isn't making sure your kids do the right things. It's making sure why they're doing what you think is the right thing. Because the minute they leave your house, they make decisions. And if the only decision grid you've been worried about is the outcome, then that's what they're going to do, is they're going to learn how to manage outcomes as adults. But if you have been working on having them become a person who makes God-honoring decisions, that's what they leave and have their life about. I want to honor God with this decision. Not, I want to get the best deal with this decision. You know, there are times when I'll have somebody help me with my taxes, and they're going, well, if you say this, or don't tell me about that, because if I know about it, we got to fill it in. And I go, well, wait a minute. I don't want to not tell you something that I need to be, you need to know for me to be integrous. Because even if it cost me $1,200 or $2,000 in a tax return, my heart and walk with God isn't for sale. And if I could sell it for $2,000, man, that's cheap. The devil would pay for that in a minute for me to not walk with God. You know? It's the why that's really important, not what you get back on your taxes. But why didn't you get anything back? I was honest this year. Oh. So when we start talking about parenting, God's a God of character. God's a God of relationship. And if we want to be, we want to be fathers that reflect our Heavenly Father, we would be fathers of character. We would be fathers of relationship. Um, let me look at uh, one more with you anyway. 
And that's the whole idea that um, uh, God is a God of development. He develops us. Okay? So, for example, in um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, it starts to talk about um, God disciplining us. So, in Hebrews 12, sorry here. Hebrews 12, 5, it says, And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastens everyone. He accepts, he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as di- discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. You're not a true son and daughter at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while while they thought as they thought best for us, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Do you hear what's being said there? That there's a harvest that comes from God's discipline. God is a developer. When Jesus was 12, he got left at at the temple area. And when his parents came back, his mom was mad. And you can just hear it in the the, uh, conversation. Why have you treated us like this? You know, and you can just see the foot south. Well, why have you treated us like this? Nobody else treats us like this. You're our oldest child. How come, how come four other brothers can be back where they're supposed to be at the right time, and you can't, and you think you're the Messiah? The sinless one, right. Why have you treated us like this? I mean, those parents had the right, in a sense, to think, can we not expect that when we say be here, you'll be here. And what I love about the scriptures, it doesn't hide that. It lets us have to wrestle through. Did Jesus sin? Well, Hebrews tells us that he didn't sin. And so we get to look at that and go, you know what? It's not a sin to be a 12-year-old. 12-year-olds are not as responsible as 40-year-olds. Moms who may be only 25 or 30, who knows how old she was when Jesus was 12, She has a different way of looking at things than he does as a 12-year-old. And she says, why have you treated us like this? Thinking that he should think like an adult. He goes, didn't you know I was about my father's business? And Luke tells us, and they didn't know what he was saying. They didn't understand because he made sense to a 12-year-old, not to an adult. And God is developmental. That's not me, is it? God is developmental, and he's basically... Um, saying, today, I want you to live with me like who you are today. And tomorrow, I want you to live having had the benefit of yesterday. And five years from now, I want our walk to look five years older than it is now. He's committed to our developing to be more like Christ. So I told you I had this um, daughter who her mom had cancer and then she died. And I've remarried and I've been married for about six years. What's interesting about that is I have three kids who've been married longer than me. And so um, when I look at my wife's relationship with me, it's a six-year-old relationship. We have communication problems that I didn't have with a person I've been married to for 30 years. And it would be ridiculous for me to say, 
this marriage isn't as good as this marriage. Unless I wanted to ratchet, ratchet this one back down and go, how did I relate with Jeannie in year five? And how am I relating with Sue in year five? And go, you know what? For year five, I'm in a pretty good marriage. For year 30, this is stupid. God isn't looking at you and saying, I want you to live like you're in heaven. He's saying, I'm getting you ready for heaven. And it's going to take your whole life and a second to get you ready for it. But he's okay with you developing. In fact, he's committed to your development program as a father. And if you could look at that as the heavenly picture of what God is asking you to be as a dad, someone who has character so that your kids can count on you rather than be afraid of the circumstances, someone who is relational and so they know that you care about them, and someone who's developmental in that they know that you're going to grow up and they're not asking you to grow up today. They're actually, and you as a dad, this is a very hard thing, to let an 8-year-old be an 8-year-old and a 14-year-old be a 14-year-old. And it becomes even harder when you have a 14-year-old and an 8-year-old because you start to think that they should act the same. And you start putting pressure on the 14-year-old to somehow, hey, you got to be the role model for the 8-year-old. Hello, you are to be the role model for the 8-year-old and the 14-year-old. And they both get their cues off you rather than you making them cue up each other. And as they kind of get a cue for you, an eight-year-old knows what responsibility looks like at 14 because they watch your 14-year-old be responsible because the 14-year-old's watching a dad be responsible, not because they're pretending to be something that they're not, an adult, so that this person can grow up. We want everybody to grow up fast because it makes our job easier. Dads, your job is not easy. Your job is to be like God, <laughs> to be a good and gracious father to children, and, and not even just to your children. As, as you get old, I don't, I don't have any kids at home. Last weekend, my oldest daughter uh, spent the weekend at my house, and um, she has three kids, and so her and her husband and three kids invaded my house, and when they left, I went, oh, God, I'm glad that's over. And it wasn't because I didn't love them. I was beat. I was tired. I, you know, I know why God gives us children when we're young. It's because we have energy. You know? Wisdom does not trump energy when it comes to parenting. And so the idea as you get older is that you actually get to become the person who shows that kid what it's like to be loved. You know? Because they can't have enough people on their team loving them. And we get to be that rather than their dads. We actually get to love them and let someone else be their dad. And there may be people who have to borrow you as a dad because they have an absentee father, but the issue predominantly is you get one shot at this. And then after that, you get to be a supporting cast to other people in their shot at it. But the cool thing is you're not trapped in a sad dad or a military dad or a mad dad. You're not trapped with that past. It can be redeemed and you can actually image or reflect a heavenly father through even what your earthly father did. Okay? Now, I know some of you are wounded and, and the heavenly father needs to heal you from your earthly father wounds. But Jesus said this, uh, he said, if you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the, Holy, will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You're not alone. You have a Heavenly Father delighting in giving you a Holy Spirit, just like you on your best day delight in blessing your child. Okay? So... That's kind of it as far as how our earthly father can warp our heavenly father, but how our heavenly father can actually use our earthly father experience to make us the delivery system of being a father to someone else.
okay? I think I have a couple minutes left if uh, anybody has any questions. That would require you waking up. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it just so happens it's actually in a book called Disciple by Bill Clem. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a list of who we are in Christ that's in that book, as well as 30 things that happen to you the moment you become a Christian, you know? And so, but you can also find similar lists online if you just say, you know, who I, uh, the I am's in Christ, and, and you can pull up a lot of those, but yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I don't, you know, the first exposure I had to this um, was, was a, a book on, uh, from a men's seminar that was probably 25 years old, and it's not even in print anymore, but um, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I bet you, you could even search that, you know, but it was pretty striking to me because my dad was never in the military. Um, my dad was 50 when I was born, and he just fell in that weird spot of being too young for World War I and too old for World War II. Um, but he had a lot of the characteristics of a military dad. Yeah. Between military dad and mad dad, uh, that was my dad. Yeah. Yes? Oh, okay, military brats. Thank you. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Uh, just out of thought, you mentioned that your daughter, your youngest daughter, was having to go through sad dad with you and everything that you were going on, going through with your, your wife. When you look back on that, I know, you know, as a father, when you have several kids, there's always going to be at least one period where you really regret some of the ways you were. Yeah. Uh, Um, okay, so the question is, if I could somehow get a mulligan on uh, the sad dad and uh, redo that or whatever, um, you know, I do think that the way I describe cancer, because that's what my wife died of, the way I de describe cancer was our family got cancer, it just happened to be in my wife's body. I mean, I have four kids that their mom's gone. Uh, my life got changed, their lives got changed, cancer changed the life we had, and we have to live with a new normal. So I don't know if I could just pull up some kind of emotional well that would have let me stride differently with her. Um, but I do think that if I could work, have worked more with my wife on the idea that this cancer, we're gonna name this cancer, it's not gonna name us. Because we let it name, you guys are, are you know, the subjects of a king called cancer. And we, I think we could have said, um, you're an uninvited guest here and you won't have the right to determine the values of our home. Um, but that would have me meant, uh, like I, every Tuesday I spent all day in a uh, chemotherapy ward in, in, my, you know, in a room where my wife just got dosed in chemo, okay? Um, it would have meant she might have had to have some of those alone so that I could have taken that same kind of time and gone to a swim meet. And at the time, unfortunately, I let chemotherapy be the trump card. And so I think, you know, what happened after she died, my, that daughter's my only unmarried child. And we do spend a lot of time together. In fact, some of my kids who are married say, um, Dad, we lost our mom and our dad when mom died. You know, and you spent all your time with Jenny. And I'm, you know, there's a part of me going, you need to get your comfort from your spouse. She doesn't have one. I'm still her dad. You know? It's like she's 27 and she's a seventh grade, um, uh, eighth grade science teacher. And... Um, this summer, she came down, uh, she lives in uh, Seattle, she came down and said, I want to buy a car, but I want you to help me buy the car, okay? 
those are dad-daughter moments, even though she's an adult woman with her own career that doesn't live in my home, you know? So I still try and make sure she knows she has a dad who cares about her, champions her. I try and uh, watch, she's a, a volleyball coach in the fall and a track coach in the spring. So I kind of watch how her teams do and text her on those kinds of things to just kind of let her know I am her cheerleader. Um, and I, I think she's just got to process the idea what did cancer do to her. But yeah, I, I wish I hadn't have been dominated by it. But I'm, and I'm not really trying to undo it. I'm just trying to be the dad that she needs now. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I think um, we're good, huh? All right, thank you.